Hello, this is Vlado Damjanovski. In this video I will talk about the latest CCTV standards, also known as IPVSS, uh, or coded 62676. This is a presentation I prepared some time ago, in actual fact about four years ago, when these standards were nearly finished and I updated in uh, 2020 when they were officially adopted by the Australian standards. So let me switch to my presentation screen. Okay, so the new uh, standards for IP systems, inter uh, Internet Protocol Systems, which is digital systems for CCTV, are actually uh, renamed to VSS for Video Surveillance Systems. Uh, reason being, um, the Chinese delegation of the IEC standards actually uh, noted that uh, China Central Television has also the same acronym of CCTV so in order to avoid confusion it was agreed that this is renamed to Video Surveillance Systems or VSS but in, fa in effect that's the same thing that we've always been using for CCTV so you can I guess use it uh, interchangeably but in any case we, it's called IPVSS standards the code name for the of the IEC is 62676 uh, under which name was also adopted by the British standards and uh, as of last year by Standard Australia so as you can see here I've made this presentation somewhere uh, on 4th of May 2017 but was updated in October 2020 so uh, we're also going to say a couple of words for the old analog standards in Australia coded for 806 uh, while the new one are uh, known as 62676 from the IEC and I'll talk about that as well and I'll uh, highlight the key important details uh, obviously we won't go we will not go through all the details of the standards there are so many of them but I thought for people wanting to learn more and know more it's good to have this uh, video put on YouTube so that you can refer to it whenever whenever you want to know uh, what are the basics. Uh, we'll speak about key factors in CCTV today and questions and answers are really because this was part of the presentation online so I guess you can always send me a question or email if you wish um, and I'm more than happy to, to respond. So introduction to the old 4806 standards. Um, these standards, first uh, of course why are standards important? Of course, they provide a framework for interoperability across the globe. They make trade between countries easier and fairer. They safeguard, assist and guide users and manufacturers to achieve most functional and interoperable systems. They provide governments with a technical base for health, safety and environmental legislation, present a set of principles for the management and operation of systems and provide a means of objectively evaluating the performance of a system. Sorry I'm reading them because I don't want you to spend too much time in reading yourself. It's just simply what were the starting point for it. So let's see first a little bit of history. In this case it's about Australian standards, uh, but certainly <coughs> it's about the evolution of technology. So um, in the past, long before 2000, so in the past century, we used analog television, analog broadcast, analog CCTV, everything was analog. Um, in fact, Australia did not have even, uh, even standards for analog until 2000 and maybe one and two when we sat down with a couple of colleagues and uh, industry professionals. We started and, de and developed the Australian AS4806 standards, which was released somewhere 2004-2005. Now, <clears throat> by the time we released this, there was already work on uh, CCTV uh, going to when to become hybrid. So in other words, there were a lot of analog cameras which were then recorded on DVR, so digital video recorders. So analog streaming was converted to digital by way of encoding or encoders. Um, and in the meantime, so this is all starting to uh, from 2000, so early this century, let's say. And uh, as we all know today, almost everything is digital. So certainly by the time we came up with the standards, digital uh, standards were starting to be developed by IEC. Uh, in fact, even though we finished this uh, at, in 2005 in Australia, uh, we actually, to be quite fair and give credit to my colleagues, uh, Les Simmons and Oli de Souza, most of them, but certainly others as well, but we really worked hard. And we even started somewhere 2008 to work on 
uh, new digital standards be because we knew this is uh, coming after we published this. So a few years after that technology changed so much, we started having high definition cameras, we started having IP networks and so forth rather than coaxial cables, rather than matrix switches. But in any case, there was a lack of interest from the industry and support, sadly. Uh, and we dropped it, but in the meantime, somewhere maybe 2010, I would say, probably 11, uh, IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, which is uh, the standard body uh, that uh, has head office in Switzerland, uh, uh, in, and it's working under the umbrella of United Nations, so all countries around the world are basically members of IEC. They started working on uh, digital standards. And that was uh, for a few years, which is when we got involved. In fact, I got involved uh, personally as well because we developed this and based on the books that I wrote before, a lot of colleagues around the world know each other. So they invited and on behalf of Australia, me and uh, Oli and Les, we started contributing to the IEC standards so that we actually finished our work by publishing the 62676-5 standards for the camera, cameras. Um, but there were already standards uh, published before we joined them. But in any case, there were a, a bunch of standards, which I will explain in this presentation, uh, known under the name 62676. And they are basically finished with publishing somewhere 2018, maybe. In 2020, Australia uh, adopted them, like UK, British did, and I'm pretty sure other countries would, would have adopted them. So we now call them AS62676. In any case, the basis is the same. So this is the technology evolution and standard evolution. Now, um, <clears throat> in Australia, in order to get involved in the, in the working of the standards, you have to be really endorsed by a non-profit organization, which makes it a little bit difficult for people like myself, which, who is running my own private business. I had to get somebody to basically endorse me to represent the non-profit organizations for this, which I did get uh, endorsed by the transport uh, um, of, uh, of New South Wales. But any of these organizations such as SMT for Society of Motion Pictures and Television Engineers uh, would endorse somebody, Australian Communication Media Authority, Engineers of Australia, Railway, Federal Police, a ASIAL, Australian Security Industry Association, National Security Association and CCTV Industry Technical and Operations Expert, which is uh, like somebody like myself that needs to participate in that, needs to be endorsed. Now, this is a bunch of um, uh, people, <laughs> Australians we call legends in CCTV, I guess, <laughs> uh, and thank you for such a humbling title. Uh, Oli, myself and Les, we were basically the one that um, uh, were the core committee for the analog standards and obviously <laughs> core committee for working on the digital standards. So. Uh, what are the old analog standards, uh, which uh, are coded under the name 4806? The first, 4806.1, basically talks about management and operation applicable to Australian CCTV system management and operation. That was ended and published 2006. AS 4806.2, this was CCTV application guidelines applicable to the latest CCTV technologies at that time, by the way. By the time we published it, we, I think technology changed already. So we, we were working on this maybe three or four years, I would say. Anyway, AS4806.3 was closed circuit television pulse signal timing and levels for CCTV and the limits of variations of such. And 4806.4 was remote video for video and security control rooms, which was published one year later. Now, the key things that I want you to basically take away from this presentation, it's to do with uh, VideoLab's uh, Calc application, which I will have on the same website um, uh, discussed and uh, have cases presented, is the actual uh, pixel density, which actually started from the actual uh, definition of face identification uh, that we uh, adopted and tested in Australia, which later on was adopted and tested, I guess, by other people. But it's the same basis. And once you understand the same basis, you get a better understanding of certain, certain uh, let's say, discussion we have about what is sufficient pixel density for identification recognition. Well, basically what we did is we had a number of tests uh, conducted where we had uh, the analog camera. So this is why this picture ap uh, approximates 4 by 3 aspect ratio. 
uh, which was the analog television at that time. So if we, if we put a person of average height uh, to be completely covered in the field of view, in the vertical field of view of the camera, so we call it 100% person's height, then if the camera is focused, of course, and we've got sufficient light, we, we're not talking about extremes which you can't sort of determine by standards. So standards assumes you have good lighting, good focus, and uh, a standard compliant camera, like in this case, power camera. So if you have a person that is 100% person's height, and that you can show it on the screen, then according to the standards, there are sufficient details of the face to identify that person. Okay, so that means if you know the basis of analog television, which is why I always say it's important to know analog because digital evolves from there in the standards and understanding of what is sufficient. So if you know analog PAL time uh, television signal, which is composed by uh, basically definition 625 scanning lines, of which 576 are active. So the most you can see in analog PAL is 576 active lines. If you have such a signal, then uh, the 100% person's height, his head or her head, would occupy about 80 to 90 pixels, which is 80 to 90 scanning lines in frame mode. Uh, and that is rough idea of what is sufficient to visually identify a person. Now, I have to also clarify something that is maybe confusing for some people. Uh, from the English language, identification recognition can be used interchangeably. But in our industry, in CCTV industry and the video surveillance systems industry, the identification has specific meaning uh, different to recognition. So identification is defined. Uh, sufficient details for you to positively identify who that person is. Uh, and how would you identify positively? You have to have seen that person before, so you know it, know him, know her. Or you may have a high quality picture, like a passport photo, that you can see and compare with what you see on the screen. So that means you identify, identify, positively identify somebody based on a known reference. So in other words, you can't identify somebody you never seen, you never know, because you don't know who that person is. And this is important to understand. So we are talking about identification as a mo method that you identify somebody because you know or you have seen before or you have seen a high quality picture of him and you've seen few of them so you know aha this is Vlado I am 100% sure this is Vlado so we say that in these analog standards that 100% person's height is sufficient to positively identify a face that's the starting point that's very important starting point then in the same standard we define face recognition and face recognition is basically half of the person's height on the screen, seen on the screen, uh, which is sufficient to recognize. Now, the meaning of recognition here is slightly different. And this is like you may not necessarily identify the person because there are probably not enough details. You might, but probably not. But you will know this is a male, female, it's got gray jumper, it's got a tie and things like that. So that's recognition. And this is half of the identification in terms of required lines in analog or pixels in, in digital. Then we also defined in the standards intrusion detection uh, amount of uh, pixels required for a person's height, which is about 10% of the 576 active lines. So we can say close to 60 pixels. We are rounding the number. And crowd control is also uh, uh, defined, which is half of the intrusion detection. So intrusion detection is that you can in the distance see yeah, most likely these are human beings. They are not dogs or cats. That's the idea. And crowd control is, uh, you probably will not recognize how many, but you can see, yeah, there are some people at that distance. And this is for positively identifying, is that a crowd or not? Uh, at least 5% of the height, which is equivalent to about 30 pixels. And finally, we defined in those standards uh, what is sufficient for visually identifying a number plate. And this is, uh, uh, assuming you have nice good picture of a static car or car that doesn't move that fast or you have frozen it in the in the process of, of capturing the image 5% which is again about 30 pixels is sufficient for visual recognition so th th that doesn't mean this is for automatic number plate recognition automatic number plate recognition and for that matter face and automatic face identification 
which some people call it face recognition, could be anything in between. Depends on the uh, algorithm quality. This is uh, defined at the time when di we did not have digital uh, have in mind. So this is an important point to remember. When we define the analogs, we did not have knowledge, no included compression artifacts, quality and um, uh, motion and different sensor sizes, different resolutions, HD, 4K, 5K and so forth. So this was defined at the time when we were happy and we uh, adopted it and accepted it as a standard. And there was also a an important point was there was also a practical point of that definition. And that practical point was once we published the standards we wanted the people that we use it, like installers, integrators, they did not have to have any uh, mathematics degree to understand 50%, 100% pixel count, uh, count the pixels and so forth, or lines in this case uh, of the analog time. Uh, it was important to just simply say, look, uh, you, when you install a system, uh, position your friend, your mate, your colleague that does installation with you uh, at the at the hallway, position the camera so that you can do the uh, lens or varifocal until you see in full height. That will guarantee face identification. That, that was the purpose, so you can easily do it without having any special tools. Of course, with digital, this is getting much more complicated because we've got so many different uh, resolutions, so many different sensor sizes, so many different um, influences of compression, which is why it uh, needs slight revision. But this is the important part, is this is the starting point. And we defined it at that time that this is to be seen on an analog CCTV monitor with minimum 400 television line horizontal resolution, uh, which is uh, important also to note because a lot of people are confusing these 400 TV lines with 400 lines. That's not the case. 400 TV lines in television is defined uh, as a normalized horizontal uh, count v uh, relative to the vertical. So in other words, it takes three quarters of the width. So when we say 400 TV lines, that actually is equivalent to having uh, 400 uh, divided by three times four, which will end up being like uh, 133, about uh, 560 uh, something television lines, 576 probably line, which is then normalizing to a vertical number of uh, uh, tracing. Uh, tracing lines or scanning lines. Okay, so this was the starting point we defined in 2006 and it's important to note that the 62676 standards uses the same starting point, which means they agree with this starting point, they probably have tested it as well, and this is how we come to um, a conclusion what is the number of pixels that is required, which I will explain in a couple of more slides. So what are the new 62676 standards. They are developed by IEC, again, International Electrotechnical Commission, which is under the umbrella of United Nations. Until 2015, Standard Australia was only an observing member in the IEC, um, uh, because we uh, were not contributing members. We had to make Standard Australia to become contributing member. That was a process that took maybe a couple of years and wasn't easy uh, to, to go through because that's a bureaucratic thing really. But however, we managed to get Australia to become a contributing member and uh, we started contributing together with other colleagues from around the world in the so-called Technical Committee Group 79, which deals with security and alarms. So uh, we became uh, uh, active participant and collaborators in 2015. Uh, you can go on the website ic.ch for the IC and of course standardaustralia.org.au for the Standard Australia uh, documents if you wish. So uh, let me explain for people in the industry and this is applicable to all around the world, not just Australia. This, there are the, f the following work groups under the uh, TC79. Work group 11 uh, deals with access control. Work group, work group 12 deals with video surveillance systems, which is where I participated as, as my colleague uh, Oli. Uh, work group 13, building intercom systems. Uh, PT62692 for digital door locks. And AHHG14 for interoperability platforms. Uh, this is at the time, probably this would be 2020, there will be 46 available standards under this technical committee 79. So we are concentrating on 62676. 
Here's a picture of the uh, uh, group that was uh, present at the Sydney meeting in 2017, the World Group 12. Uh, this is in the offices of Standard Australia and we were very pleased to have them from all around the world flying and exchanging information. We were working uh, on uh, updating the standards, modifying, uh, debating, discussing and so forth. But it's a hard work really, especially when you know this is really a voluntary work. So um, I'm proud to say that I really managed to put all my efforts, but sadly you can't really do it all the time. It's just simply uh, a heroic work for a lot of experts there. They are contributing for basically no money. Uh, and so because of that, because there's so many people, so many involved, it takes time. It takes time. And uh, to our uh, luck or unlucky, um, technology forwards very quickly. So really standards are constantly evolving. They are never finished. Uh, so here we are at the basics of 62676. And this is what is adopted by uh, Australian standards and New Zealand standards. But basically it applies to the, to the ISC because the, the codes are the same. So this is just briefly what they uh, cover. This is what they look like here in the bottom right hand corner. 62676-1-1 uh, is general system requirements. 1-2 is performance requirements for video transmission. 2-1 is video transmission protocols general requirements. 2-2 video transmission protocols IP interoperability implementation based on HTTP and REST services info on HTTP and REST available. So as you can see here, we are already starting dealing with just IP. This has never been before, obviously, with the analog. 2-3 uh, is video transmission protocols, IT interoperability implementation based on web services. Dash 3 is analog and digital video interfaces, kind of bridging the analog with digital. Dash 4 is an important one that I'll touch upon, which is application guidelines. And this is actually what uh, discusses and introduces pixel densities, actually. So that's a very important standard for us. As you can see here, it was published 2014, so already seven years ago. Uh, then we have Dash 5, which is where I contributed uh, camera measurements. That was released 2018. Uh, then there was 5-1 environmental test methods that was added. And finally, my colleague Oli was contributing a lot into VCA, which is Dash 6. So these are the, so far, the 62676 standards. Uh, important to note here is that um, uh, the two series more or less were adopting the ONVIF. And this is the standard which actually uh, bridged the non-standard but just a uh, network video interface forum as a informal standard that was developing this in, uh, interoperability um, um, uh, codes became part of the standard 62676. We in fact had uh, members of the ONVIF uh, in the standards and they were also contributing immensely in, in uh, adding this into the standards. Um, so this is a little bit more detail and I don't think I should go too many uh, in too much details there but you can certainly uh, browse and I don't want to read this. Okay so one, the dash one dash one one dash two uh, we go the next 2-1, 2 2-3, 3, 4, 5. Obviously a lot of things here about camera parameters, resolution, signal to noise, minimum measure. And I'll explain in the next slides the important key things for us. The resolution is measured differently. Minimum illumination is measured differently than analog times, and that's what I think it's important for our uh, colleagues to understand. Talking about lens, inputs, formats, video pan and tilts, network security, and measurement technology, measuring technology. 5-1 is to do with the environmental influences on cameras, so you can't always, or you shouldn't uh, ignore the uh, heat or the cold weather uh, influencing the camera performance. And the IPVSS uh, video analytics is very important because in a way includes artificial intelligence, neural networking, programming, are all becoming sort of part of that. Um, as I mentioned, ONVIF becomes part of it. So here's some of the profiles that are available so far, at least until last year. As you can probably see on ONVIF website, easy to find. We've got uh, various different profiles for interoperability between digital devices because with 
uh, digital uh, introduction of digital systems it became very difficult to know which camera will work with which recorder or which um, uh, video management system so it was important to include on with uh, as a as a good standing po uh, starting point for open network video interface forum uh, basically protocols so let's see what are the important new details for me uh, as a technical person always measuring and evaluating camera qualities the first and most important is to understand that now we are no longer measuring resolution with television lines which was defined when you had electrons beam scanning horizontally so depending on the beam thickness whether it's monochrome uh, screen CRT typically or color with RGB uh, we no longer have ability to measure television lines in that mode all camera signals now produce digital uh, pista, uh, pixel real estate uh, basically a raster or matrix of pixels so it was decided that we measure resolution the same way like, like it is measured in photography and in photography typically it's measured with line pairs uh, but to be accurate, we actually measure line pairs per picture height. Why picture height? Because we've got different aspect ratio. No longer is 4 by 3 main aspect ratio. We've got 16 by 9 as the most common. As you know, standard one, the television at home that you watch is 16 by 9. But in CCTV, we also have cameras with 3 by 2 aspect ratio, 4 by 3 aspect ratio, maybe even wider than 16 by 9. In any case, uh, whatever you measure, you normalize it to the uh, height pixels, which is why it's called per picture height. Now, line pairs are now introduced to be measured. Um, well, easiest way or the standard suggests, but of course you can you can measure it whichever way you want as long as you come to the same results. But uh, line pairs are, are important because you can't measure just lines in this case. Like to see, to distinguish uh, black and white, you need to have both black and white on a projection on the matrix of pixels, let's say the sensor. If you have black lines, let's say very fine black lines right next to each other to cover every single pixel row, then uh, you will have nothing but black screen. So you can't discern uh, lines. For that reason, you need to have black and white. So you need to have a pair. So you need to have black and white alternating in order to uh, uh, see what is the minimum you can maximum you can see what is the minimum size of these details that your camera will resolve now another important thing that this standard uh, uh, suggests and introduced uh, we are now uh, measuring resolution the easiest way to measure resolution uh, is with Siemens star, sine wave star we call it now sine wave means as you can see here uh, the black and white rays are actually not very sharp edges black between black and white. They actually transition as a sine wave in terms of brightness and contrast black to white. And reason for that is um, uh, very practical in electronics in general, in all electronics, signal propagation, when you have uh, basically digital processing. Um, if you have very sharp jumps uh, of the edges, uh, it produces unwanted ringing effect or artifacts which are not there. Uh, so with sine waves, actually, it's much more accurate measuring the resolution uh, by basically not having this ringing artifact because the, the sine wave follows the sine, which is the basic form when the actual processing uh, is happening inside the electronics. So that's the best I can describe. So in other words, sine wave stars have certain uh, contrast that changes as you go higher and higher resolution. So if your camera cannot, can no longer resolve uh, the fine details here, black and white become so close, they become like gray, so it become color in between, which is why we say the, me the point where the uh, ratio between black and white difference in luminance is uh, less than 10%, that is where you stop seeing the resolution. That's the simplest uh, definition of that. So in other words, what you do is, and he is, this is what re is represented on this drawing. If you imagine uh, this black and white are shown with peak and valley. So peak is white, valley is black. Mind you, this will be usually, white will be lesser than 100% white. Black will be higher than 0% black or 100% black. And uh, if you basically divide the difference 
white peak minus B peak, which is here shown as W minus B. You divide that by white plus B, white plus B, and multiply by 100, you get in percentage the actual so-called depth of modulation. Now, if people remember reading uh, some of my books in the past for analog uh, television resolution measurements, we also had depth of modulation there too. We just measured that the black and white again in the similar way, peak black, peak white, uh, minimum black, and then you divide and you made, I think in the analog we stick, we were sticking to 5%, I think, but in this instance we stick to 10%. Uh, so we say if the depth of modulation is, for example, if because this you don't forget, this is going to be converted into digital. So when it is digital, you can easily see the binary value of the white, binary value of the black. And this example here says, imagine if you've got uh, the white to be 230 uh, bits, uh, not bits, 230 number, because we've got 8 bit, uh, usually we've got 8 bit luminance in CCTV, so uh, we get 2 to the power of whatever it is to get to 230. Maximum is 255, minimum is 0. So let's imagine white is 230 values, and let, let's imagine the, the black is 25 uh, uh, values. Uh, then you, what you do is divide, uh, take 20, uh, 25 of 230, 230 minus 25, divided by 230 plus, plus 25, you get 0.8 times 100 becomes 80%. So in that case, it means at this particular point, in this case, this is an example, of course, at this particular point, we've got 500 line pairs per picture height resolution defined by this formula. And this is how actually we are uh, we are measuring resolution in analog, uh, sorry, in, uh, of course, in digital, in digital television now, line pairs per picture height which is why we have actually uh, video labs, obviously you probably would know, produces test charts. Now we've got a test chart that uh, is designed with five of these Siemens stars, the bigger one being in the center, and this is what it means. So if you measure, actually we've got software as well, in case you want to know more, you can go on video labs website and you can look for the test chart. We actually have software that does that automatically for you. Uh, so you don't have to do it manually, even you can do it if you want. But basically the software finds the point where this 10% depth of modulation stops. So in this case, this will, this will be the red, which represents the center circle. Uh, we will obviously have the other four corners, so we can see how the geometry is and how the corner resolution is relative to the central resolution. But uh, this is typical, let's say, curve that will show you the MTBF or mean time, sorry, not the MTBF, I'm sorry, MTF, modulation transfer function. Uh, and uh, this is like 0 to um, whatever line pairs per picture height. Maximum is uh, so-called Nyquist uh, resolution, which is 540 lines per per picture height. Uh, 540 is for HD standard. Because HD standard has vertical pixels 1080, in order to have line pairs, divide that by two, obviously, for black and white. The maximum you can have of HD camera system, the maximum resolution, according to the new standards, is 540 line pairs per picture height. In this instance, we've measured a, a signal of a camera, and we ended up being that the 10%, the minimum, uh, the, the minimum depth of modulation is about 515 line pairs per picture height. Again, this is the new way of measuring resolution. Okay, the next interesting thing that uh, with the new standards we define differently to the previous analog standards is minimum illumination. Now, if most of you would have worked with the uh, minimum illumination, you would be witnessing uh, quite unrealistic uh, statements by many manufacturers. Our camera can sit down to 0 0.0001 lux which is often impossible, or oh, it's impossible with three zeros because you can hardly generate a electrons from such a low light for only a couple of photons and be recognized among the sea of noise generated electrons. So uh, because of insufficient clarification in analog days, what we decided with this one to say this, we don't care how you set up your camera in terms of AGC, um, compression, whatever. When you're measuring noise, we want to see uh, illumination 
measured in luxes, reflected of the things that you are looking at with the camera, when the video drops down to 300 or 30 percent, in this case 300, because we are showing here a waveform of a digital signal being converted to analog when it's basically projected on the screen, whether that is a display on the computer or display uh, on a uh, HD decoder or 4K decoder, it doesn't matter. The point is we've got 0 to 1023 if it is in this case uh, uh, 10 bit, but in our case most of the time will be 8 bit, so 0 to 255. So 30% um, of 255 will be roughly about um, 3 times 2. 60, 15, 70, 80, let's say 80, uh, level 80, 70 to 80 is 30 percent. In any case, it's 30 percent of the peak white that is taken as a minimum that you need to see. And at that time, when basically you're doing that with the light dimming, as you can see here, this is actually taken off our test chart. So we have a uh, lux meter looking at the test chart from the side and position of the camera. We dim the light. We dim the light until we actually have this uh, from peak 100% or 1023 or let's say 255 start dropping until it gets to 30%. If you go below it, this goes even further, but the minimum illumination for, for this particular testing would be 0.12 lux because the, the meter, the lux meter shows 0.12. And then obviously when you're stating this, you also have to say with what lens are you stating this. My camera can see down to 0.12 lux using f1.4 lens. And that's it. So obviously this is defined for visible light. We don't define minimum illumination for infrared because lux is, is measuring only visible spectrum. And we are just quoting what is the lens f-stop because clearly if we, if we have a lens f-stop 1.0 instead of 1.4, we'll have twice as much uh, low light uh, performance because the lens is uh, with wider aperture will transmit more light. There you have it. So this is the minimum illumination according to the new standards. It measured down to 30% reflected light. So in other words, make sure you measure uh, the illumination reflected from the test chart. You don't measure like many people uh, basically make a mistake. They are pointing the sensor towards the camera, towards the light and measure. That's not how you measure uh, reflected light. You measure reflected light from the point of view of the camera because it is the camera that needs to see what it comes from the from the actual object or test chart. Uh, we also defined uh, methods for uh, measuring dynamic range. Um, that's a little bit tough because you can't measure dynamic range reflected of a passive uh, test chart or test chart that doesn't have illumination. So there are special test chart that uh, as many manufacturers produce where actually there is a strong light behind it through a transparency film you usually have up to uh, 32 or 36 patches each one progressively darker and darker from the brightest to the darkest and the brightest should be equivalent to about 100,000 luxes or so which would replicate the normal environment outside if it is very bright sunny day and by measuring that the software measurement uh, it, it, it gets you a number of how many how many uh, decibels of dynamic range your camera can have. Mind you, this is uh, uh, artificially done, so that dynamic range should be not confused with the dynamic range that comes from the sensor itself, because the sensor itself has got very narrow dynamic range, really. Sensors hardly have more than 46, 48 decibels, and yet you, most of you would know that dynamic range is quoted 110, 120 decibels. This is done by so-called double exposure, which you don't see it because you still have 25 images a second with a, a well-done dynamic or WDR uh, uh, electronics. But the point is that that means that your camera does one long exposure as long as it can, which is typically 1 25th of a second, and very short time, maybe 1,000th of a second exposed very briefly, in order to get the very bright objects de uh, de detected properly, so you can discern between the brightest and next one below it. And that's how you get the high dynamic range, which is, again, we usually call it WDR, but not to be confused with the dynamic range of the sensor itself. So I think in the standards we refer to this as apparent dynamic range. In any case, the CCTV people will know what, what I mean. Um, and because we don't have a test chart, this is 
uh, uh, promoting test chart in a way, but certainly it's useful because there is no other test chart specifically designed for CCTV like ours. So I just want to pay uh, make attention, uh, turn your attention to we actually found a way to uh, measure indicatively which camera has better uh, dynamic range than the others by using not uh, really a same uh, illumination uh, box like here, which is uh, quite considerably um, a pricey thing to have. Of course, I encourage you if you can afford it, please buy that. That will be more accurate. But you can use the test chart and just simply get a very strong LED uh, illuminator and get a transparent film which is used for uh, calibrating scanners, like a film scanners. They have uh, typically Kodak or Polaroid uh, uh, um, patterns with colors and gray scale. And what you basically achieve, you're trying to achieve setting on your camera, if you're comparing to cameras, which one can have details both of the object in the dark, as well as details of the object in the bright. If you make, if you achieve to have both of them, that camera has certain dynamic range compared to the other, which may not even see anything here. It will be so bright for the for such a camera, it won't see this. It will see just a white thing. Or others may go the other way, may see dark completely, I, where the test chart is, and you will see details here, but nothing appears here. You don't quantify it in a way, but you can still compare if you want to do it that way. But certainly, this is the scientific method where you can measure with the software. Uh, which patch is what, how many uh, bits of, of uh, luminance. Okay, uh, the next thing to explain is that the 62676-4 brought the um, pixel density as a very nice and clever way of measuring clarity of an object, which takes into account all the variables that we didn't have before in analog times. That takes into account the sensor size, the pixel count, obviously it took account into account the focal length, the distance of the object. So this is a formula which a lot of people would know by now. This is the formula we uh, advised to the standards uh, to have uh, at the back of the, uh, in the annexes. But also this is the formula we use in our Vidalabs calculator. So in other words, it doesn't matter what sensor size you use, as long as you know which one it is, uh, and as long as you know the distance to the object and focal length, you can calculate pixel density. So what pixel density covers, I'll show you in the next slide. And this is what the 62676-4 suggests. So remember what we said uh, during the Australian standards. They also start from the same point like we had in a 100% person's height in the field of view. That is sufficient for face identification. That's perfect. That's fine. We, it's, uh, we agree with that because we did it. We tested, and this is basically the same concept well, like we had in uh, uh, in uh, Australian 4806 standards. Then the uh, 62676-4 defined 5% for monitoring crowd, which they say is equal to 12.5 pixels per meter. And I'll uh, basically, these pixels per meter are derived in that case from this formula. So 10% is for detection intrusion, 25 for observed, 50% for recognition, like we said, 100% for identification, and 400 for inspection. So this is a new, uh, let's say, value that was introduced that we didn't have. Inspection is kind of close up. So in other words, it's as good quality as your passport photo, and maybe better. It is for that purpose, called inspection. Uh, a lot of people know this as DORI. Uh, detect, observe, recognize, identify as DORI standards, whatever you use it and call it, this is the meaning. The most important is identification is defined by 100%. And uh, basically uh, what we can say is if you can express pixel density, then that pixel density includes all camera parameters. Hence, it applies to any camera resolution. So this is an important part. This, this solves the problem of digital CCTV having so many different sensor sizes, sensor pixel count, uh, uh, megapixels. So people using pixel density actually can bring them to the same uh, common denominator. What is that you want to do? I want to identify. OK, you need to have 250 pixels per meter, according to this standard at least. So what does that mean? You basically enter all your details and you find out from such a distance, I need to have that focal length for my sensor to have pixel density of 250. Basically, that's all it is. It's just a little bit of calculation, which is why we have the VDLABS calculator. But anyway, so what I want to also bring to your attention here 
and I don't want people to understand this wrong because some people still resist that. But actually, uh, we at the Australian standards found that this is inconsistent. 250 pixels per meter is inconsistent with what you see in the same standard as a picture. Okay, so it contradicts to it in a way. Why? Because, okay, if the pulse signal is composed of 576 active lines, which is, that means if a person occupies 100% monitor's height, which is what we said for analog standards, and we, if we assume roughly a person height is, let's say, average 1.7 meters, so basically you average from male, female, um, then really if you divide 576 by 1.7, you, you get 339 pixels per meter, not 250. And what we are saying uh, as an um, approximation, let's make it 350 pixels per meter as required minimum pixel density for face identification. That's what we think is then consistent with its own standard 100%, because really this refers to analog uh, standard, which we said we adopted it and we uh, agree with that. But don't forget, at that time we said we only have analog picture, the best possible picture you can get without compression. And obviously we also have losses through A to D conversion, then we got compression. So we, have, we are now in this adding a little bit to 339, which is literal translation uh, from 100% uh, person's height to pixel density. We are now uh, adding a little bit, and this is very little. We are saying that it has to be at least 350 pixels per meter for positively identifying a face. We actually, Australian standards, submitted a corrigendum in 2018 for this to be changed to reflect the actual drawing and what we found to be correct. And this is why you will see in the Videolabs calculator version 2, which is the one that we released in, in um, this year, in 2021, we actually no longer use 250 as a, a, a face identification uh, standard reference. We use 350, which we think is correct. It's your choice which one you want to use, but we say if you really want to be 100% sure you capture an 85 person, you should have at least 350. Why? We have done a lot of testing, and you will see here in this picture how different pixel density will look with different lighting condition, different sensor sizes. Sensors that are very small pixels, typically in CCTV, are very noisy, especially at high temperature and especially at low light. When it's noisy and it's compressed, you have a lot of artifact that is difficult to, to basically recognize small details. So in the top row, all images are 250 pixels per meter. Okay, But the one on the left hand side here is in low light. See here you can say, yes, I can, I can, this is louder for sure. I can see the test chart and everything, that's 250 pixels per meter. So no problem, this is good. But this is done with a SLR or digital full frame camera that actually gets as good picture as you can. But once you go to a phone, let's say smartphone, at HD, don't forget, we are also testing this during the HD resolutions, uh, 250 pixels per meter at low light, look how blurry the face is. Now, if somebody hasn't seen me or doesn't have a picture of me, may struggle to really recognize if that's me or not. Look at the test chart here. What you can see is quite different to what you can see at full bright light here. And in between, this is the same phone that was here for low light. This is the same phone, but daytime, yeah, maybe you will say, okay, I, I can recognize this as well. All right. But to be more positive, here is the bottom part. is all 350 with different cameras. Still, obviously the best is with a full large sensor with little noise in pixels or less than small sensor. Even there in low light, 350 pixels, maybe just on the verge, I would say, because you can see, okay, maybe you will recognize me, okay? The point is, this is showing you practically the difference between 250 pixels per meter and 350 with different sensors, different light levels. And obviously, I want you to consider that when you're deciding. So, pixel density also needs to cater for compression artifacts as well which was not the case in the analog times. More noise from small pixels, especially in low light and especially in high temperatures. Uh, places like Australia, close to the desert, or maybe Africa, or maybe um, California, uh, near, near uh, Arizona or Texas or whatever, 
high temperature and low light will produce a lot of noise. The smaller the pixels, the more noise will be. The, the noise will be more obvious in low light. Also, we haven't considered motion blur. This is why we have in our VLABS calculator also calculation of motion blur due to faces moving during capture. So if you've got 250 pixels per meter and the person moves, that's almost impossible to recognize. If it was 350, maybe there is a chance. Okay, obviously you would ideally want the person or the, the object to be static, but nothing of interest in CCTV is static. Everything moves, typically intruders or cars involved in bank robbery or whatever. And of course, it's very important to have good lens optical resolution. And that is maybe, okay, of course, but smaller sensors demand more from lens optical qualities. The smaller the sensor is, not only it's more noisier, but actually the lens performance is harder to achieve, which makes the image look blurry. When you compress blurry image in low light, that also contributes to this uh, difficulty to identify. Okay, so this is all from me uh, on this stage. Let me see the picture. This is um, not probably so interesting for a lot of you. I want to go to the slide that I'm, think, I'm thinking is very important. But we also have rotating test chart to uh, cope and measure, cope with and measure uh, artifacts appearance of object moving because obviously static test chart is really for static objects. But we now have also a rotating test chart which will show you quite different artifacts depending on what the resolution and how many luxes you've got and you can see here quite a lot of different artifacts which again we can we do as a service we can test your cameras if you want to but it just definitely tells you that when objects is moving it's much harder to recognize identify even though maybe the pixel density is sufficient even with our suggestions of 350 pixels per meter okay now this is an important table that i want you to remember and perhaps uh, you can write it down but this is the pixel density that actually tells you um, in addition to faces and number plates if you remember we mentioned at the very beginning for 4806 we actually have devised and calculated pixel density required for playing cards money casino chips uh, face inspection money and coins so in the middle it is what the IEC 62676-4 pixels per meter uh, uh, recognizes or, or recommends. On the right hand side, the video labs, this is our calculation which we, which we uh, submitted as a corrigendum and up to here. And then at the bottom is something that we calculated for other objects. So basically pixel density can be applied to any object that you look. It doesn't have to be a face. It doesn't have to be a number. It could be of interest might be a bottle of shampoo that your camera looks at and you want to read the details. Everything can be defined with pixel density which will give you a freedom to choose whatever camera you find, you match with the lens, with the good resolution you can achieve what is required as long as you know what is required. And again th this is a whole new uh, uh, video presentation I have to do if you want me to but this is what I'm doing in our in our seminars online seminars but clearly here what we say is um, IEC recommends 250 for face identification we say 350 for for the reasons that I explained above so we say for face recognition is 175 for observing is 88 for detection is 35 for monitoring is 17 license plates between 300 and 400 playing cards 500 pixels per meter this is like for casinos money for banks in casinos we calculated and we think that 660 pixels per meter should be more than enough for you to be able to identify any kind of money so we're not talking here about just uh, american dollars but obviously i've tested with many different nodes different colors different sizes they are more or less of a similar size so they require a bit more uh, pixel density than playing cards because playing cards are um, kind of the same and the same size there is a standard for the, the playing cards called b5 i believe but in any case we've tested with cards and money require a little bit more because there are such a variety of them casino chips which are even smaller if you're doing casino system need 1200 pixels per meter uh, equivalent to face inspection instead of 1000 pixels per meter which is what i see uh, suggest we calculate you need 1400 to fall within in line with this this is 1400 rather than 1000 and all these are entered, so both the face identification, the LPR, 
the money and playing cards, the face identification, and uh, I think money and coins are into the uh, Videolabs calculator version 2. And almost last but not least, let me uh, give you an important detail of 62676-4, which is very practical, and actually this is something we can't correct, simply because it's a great idea. I never uh, thought of that, and certainly some UK colleagues from Home Office have come up with this, and I, I would like to explain that how that is used. Um, it is very practical, and you don't need to, kn to know any maths uh, for face identification. But what this does is, these are freely available, uh, various color skin color faces that are similar but different so uh, basically then uh, they are marked with a1 a2 a3 b1 b2 b3 c1 c2 c3 uh, uh, so what you do is you you can get you can download these images from uh, different websites including video labs website so if you go video labs under download you will see this can be downloaded and you actually can get this in full a4 format printed out. You can print them out yourself. Uh, I suggest you use uh, matte paper, matte, matte photographic paper, so the quality is as good as possible. And when you print them on A4 format, this is approximately human size, human head size. So what you do is, you basically, this is what you do. You basically get, uh, during commissioning of a system, uh, you get the operator to sit in front of his computer screen and look at the uh, what face somebody over there like your colleague that works with you will flash uh, for the operator to guess out of the nine that he chooses so he needs to know he needs to guess is it a1 a2 uh, a3 or b1 b2 b3 or c1 c2 c3 so this guy walks from a distance closer and closer until the operator start guessing all of them so he pulls the faces at random see he needs to do it in random so that he can verify that this guy really can recognize all of them so every time he pulls up he knows at the back of that would be really written this is a2 and the guy says a3 oh no wrong okay another one he makes a mistake this guy comes closer maybe half a meter or a meter closer to the camera the point where the distance from the camera where the operator can guess all of the random drawn faces is then considered sufficient. This is the distance for, for successful positive identifying face identification uh, distance. And I think that's very simple, maybe time consuming, but certainly very useful uh, 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 method, which actually considers everything. Like if you have that system to uh, have to recognize things, especially at night, because it's a maybe walkway at night and you actually consider also the illumination levels and that means if this person recognizes them uh, at that time that is very good for the environment which is most important for, for, such, an, uh, for such a CCTV system or a VSS system. There you go. So this is what was introduced with the 62676-4 and I highly recommend that you should try it. Uh, another little thing that we added to it which is uh, the motion blur uh, pixel shift I call it. This is uh, my drawing that uh, the standards adopted to put in there. Here is the formula which we actually use in the VideoLabs calculator. And now with the latest version 2 of the VideoLabs calculator we introduced also the angle of travel relative to the optical axis. That's very important because the original formula doesn't consider, well it's only telling you when somebody goes perpendicular to the optical axis with certain speed. I did certain f calculation that verifies uh, how many displaced uh, pixels you have uh, by using different exposures and when it goes at a certain uh, angle then it's uh, uh, basically uh, very generic and you can use any distance as long as you know under what angle the car passes by 100 kilometers an hour uh, you can calculate that and I'll show you some uh, video in my video labs calculated tutorials I'll show you some case studies which is very practical one in uh, another important thing that in the uh, in the standards was mentioned and that is the uh, uh, latency of the PTZ control uh, as we all know the uh, PTZ control is a, a problem uh, in digital more than in the analog because there is a delay when somebody does PTZ control if you have PTZ if you don't have PTZ probably you wouldn't see a problem but typically in casinos they want to follow uh, 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 guys on the floor let's say somebody that is suspicious or whatever and the point is 
there is a delay because of the uh, video compression uh, technique of GOPS or group of pictures, which is always a um, few hundred milliseconds. Sometimes could be shorter, sometimes longer, depending upon your choice. But in any case, this standard says that if you've got less than 200 milliseconds or 0.2 of a second uh, latency, then uh, there is no noticeable response time problem or n n doesn't notice response time uh, an issue. The operator can follow an opti uh, and uh, the operator can follow the object in the field of view. If it is from 0.2 to 0.5 seconds, it, it, it feels the delay and tries to adopt. So logically a person will try to adopt and he knows where to go and start moving. Obviously, if it is more than half a second up to two seconds, it is a strong delay. That's probably not acceptable. Uh, is disturbed by delayed response. System shall, in that case, system should display, please wait, to tell him that the, the system is delayed because of uh, latency and maybe putting together gops and processing and whatever. If it is more than two seconds, it's unacceptable for PTZ control. Now, I just want to explain and highlight this part. This is something that uh, we have actually also tested a long time ago when I was designing some of the uh, casino systems. Uh, it's actually interesting to note, and this is also in my books and presentations, that um, this 200 milliseconds is not by chance. It is actually uh, considered or is based on the latency between human vision and brain processing and action. So it is known that from the time you see something, by the time you issue command for quick action, you will not be able to do it any quicker than 200 milliseconds. Most people will do it at 300 milliseconds. I actually have tested my reflexes, and you can get a little app uh, on for iPhone or for Android uh, devices where they test your uh, reflexes. So even if you are very close to the, uh, let's say, color changing uh, quadrant, and it tells you, uh, press it as soon as you see change of color, and you try and do it as soon as you can, you will find out that you will never ever be able to do faster than 200 milliseconds. This is actually simply because of the delay between vision processing in the brain and making a decision and your uh, muscles move. So we are using in a way that knowledge, even though you don't have to know it, I guess, but it is that knowledge uh, makes you understand why up to 200 is acceptable. Obviously, you would like to have zero, but even up to 200 milliseconds, you hardly will notice that because you can't react any faster. Anyway, so that's part of the of the new standards. And final, um, before the final, is uh, there is a simple way of testing the latency, which uh, I suggested it, and this is my drawing again. Uh, so what the way how you can test the easiest way you can test the, the latency is uh, you put the camera to look at its own projection on a screen. So this screen is decoding. So this camera is connected to a system decoding through a um, decoder or through the computer and you see what the camera actually sees. So the camera sees, so these are real hands in front of it. This is the projected hands. So what you do is obviously in that case you need to have time code with the milliseconds shown at the bottom or somewhere in the screen. If you have that, you basically you basically are going to measure very easily by clapping hands. That's that's what it shows. Like if you clap hands, you actually can see on the screen the clapping that the camera sees now. You actually see it in this case 250 milliseconds later. So you would say here the latency is about 250 milliseconds. And that's basically the simple way how you can measure it. Certainly there could be some other methods, uh, I'm sure, but this is just suggestion by the standard one way to measure it is this. Okay, so where are we at? Key factors in CCTV today. The current state of CCTV, new standards are here to assist all, of course. In order to make most of them, CCTV professionals need to understand the key parameters in a modern IPVSS system. Everything starts from the camera. Hence, it is the most important part. Not because I specialize in cameras, I'm just telling you the camera is the most important. Without a good camera, no IP design can improve the quality of the video. And a lack of camera technology understanding will produce inferior results, no matter how good your system is. Simple. Important camera parameters. Obviously, optics is the first. That looks at the object. So the focal length, the line pairs per millimeter, which is a resolution of the optics. Uh, the 
optics auto iris manual iris infrared light correction if you're using infrared they're all part of the optic quality most important is the resolution i would say and i would say distortion optical distortion be aware we also uh, pay attention to of the uh, of of users especially to very wide angle lenses in fact we have also another video that shows very wide angle lenses where you see barrel distorted images cannot be used for accurately predicting or calculating pixel density simple reason being is explained in that video so i don't want to go through it but i would say very simply look at your wide angle lens if the object appears barrel shaped at the edges chances are you will not be able to correctly calculate pixel density the way you want or anything else for that matter because the width is no longer what the lens shows you uh, according to the optical calculations because of such a distortion um, then what is important is the sensor size of course the smaller the sensor uh, the smaller the pixels are the more noise the harder for optics is to achieve sharpness on that the larger the sensor the better but of course that's more expensive so here we have in CCTV typically people always try to find the lowest cost camera lens and sadly that cannot be always the best quality picture so be wise be clever in deciding I always try to get the largest sensor I can uh, 1 over 1.9 inch you will see some of my case studies I like this sensor because this is even bigger than half inch and I don't want to go 4k I can but I typically prefer HD because pixels are four times bigger than if it was 4k and when that is four times bigger guarantees me that in low light I will see basically four times better uh, than the actual 4k with the same size sensor in any case that's your decision you have to test it but certainly the larger the pixels the better pixel count of course 4k now 8k is coming of course uh, in broadcast they're already using 8k but I think in, in CCTV because we have such a small size sensors probably 8k will be struggling however 4k may become slightly better pixel sizes typically measured in microns uh, in CCTV we most often have about two micrometers for pixel size compare this to four or five microns like in photography four microns even though this looks like only only twice big but it is not two microns means this is four square micrometer pixel area this is 16 square micrometer so this actually is four times bigger than this in gathering light therefore the low light performance of four micrometer will be better similar two micrometers versus this uh, one micrometer is typically most smartphones will have about one micrometer that's very small I don't think technology can go any lower than that because this is actually at the edge of refraction problem so called but that's an optical thing and I can explain that in another video uh, another important thing is compression encoding obviously H.264 265 gets very popular and that's very good compression small but also very good for moving objects you may want to use motion JPEG much bigger but it offers other advantages uh, without taking gops and time into consideration image processing of course every camera has different image processing this is where a lot of people don't realize that the same camera coming from the factory you can adjust it so much better by just knowing what to do and how to change and again this is something I can show in separate video but in there would be noise reduction wide, wide dynamic range gamma AGC and so forth take most of your cameras all of the above uh, to make most of your cameras all of the above need to be considered now there are two different types of compression which again is part of my normal training but this is just very uh, summary very small summary most IP cameras encode compress the video inside the camera this is what we call IP camera uh, there are two categories of compression image compression and video compression both of which are usually available inside the camera it depends how you set it by default you would probably get video compression Video compression, most people would know H.264 or H.265 these days. Now, 265 is better, but demands more processing power on the decoding side. Because in the camera, H.265 is done by hardware encoders in the camera itself, so you don't worry about the speed there. But when you're decoding 6 or 12 or 4 of H.265 in large screen, you need a lot of GPU power to do that properly. Otherwise, it may be better to stick to H.264. 
uh, but image compression are two-dimensional so video compression is called also three-dimensional because it takes time into consideration which is horizontal vertical pixels and time that produces the so-called GOPS or group of pictures which is why it is so efficient which is why it's so small for the information you get but the delay or the latency is a side effect in a way and slight artifacts from moving objects uh, image compression is two-dimensional which is basically horizontal and vertical only and typical representative is JPEG and JPEG 2000 which is based on wavelet compression this is very nice for static images especially if you know uh, something happens very quickly but you can trigger it at that time then you don't worry about the latency all you need is a trigger point this is typically for red light cameras speed cameras usually you've got a loop in the ground all you need is to trigger the loop and then 5 mega 10 megapixels can be taken just one image is enough for you to recognize who that car is you don't care about video compression but uh, uh, these are much bigger if you make 25 images a second of jpeg rather than h264 this will be at least 10 times bigger in terms of bandwidth and storage so you choose what you what you need okay so video compression is more efficient than image compression video quality depends on megabits per second good crop structure processing frames per second does not influence megabits per second a lot of people think uh, how many i should put the 10 frames per second with h264 rather than 25 well that will not change megabits per second because megabits per second is megabits per second that means if you say i want to record and my calculation is to record with four megabits per second streaming compression whether you put in this four megabits per second 10 images per second or 25 that four megabits is four megabits and it will give you the same length of recording so it is wrong to reduce number of frames per second in order to in thinking that you will reduce the storage you're not because storage is defined by megabits per second by the encoder so lower fps frames per second does not save bandwidth and last slide is conclusion standards are designed to assist and guide standards are not a law but have to be implemented in the compliant tender response standards are evolving and grow with the progress of technology the standards belong to the industry and everybody involved in it a camera know-how is needed not just ip and networking i find a lot of said to say a lot of uh, system these days is decided upon by it guys which sadly most of them have no idea about the camera and as you can see here camera is the first point of input if you do not make most of it the best network in the world will not give you any better results so make sure you understand how camera works and if you need any more help i'm here to help thank you for listening and i hope you learned a lot see you next time